I'm going to start by learning a lesson myself. Um, Sinead talked about accessibility, so I'm going to start by describing myself. I am a brown man. I'm six foot. Actually, I'm probably just under. Um, and I am wearing some denim jeans, a white t-shirt, and a denim jacket. Because this is business of fashion, I wanted to start by telling you about some clothing, but I promise nothing to do with the metaverse. It was March 2020, and I was preparing for my April wedding. I was stood in front of a mirror, and was wearing a Shirvani. And for those that don't know, a Shirvani is a long, it's a long jacket with a Nehru collar, and it's very tradition, traditional for South Asian grooms. And every wedding that I had been to, I'd seen this Shirvani, this beautiful garment. I couldn't wait to be one of those men to wear it. And I'd actually imagined more than once, in fact, with my mum, what my Shirvani would look like. And then here I was, finally wearing that Shirvani, staring at my reflection, dressed in this Pakistani outfit. But I didn't feel excitement. Honestly, a, a part of me felt disgusted. I felt like I wasn't entitled to own this heritage, that I couldn't call it my own because I'm gay. And I'd never seen two grooms together in Shirvani before. I had spent so long keeping the Pakistani side of me separated from the gay side. And here they were, standing in the very same reflection, demanding equal space inside of me, but also outside of me. And the idea of walking through this room full of people, full of my loved ones, in a Shirvani, with another man by my side, it induced a deep, deep fear. And do you know what it was a fear of? It was a fear that I might be seen for who I really was. Not just a part of me, but all of me. Then COVID hit, and my wedding was cancelled. And amongst the many emotions that, of that time, I'm ashamed to say, particularly with my wonderful, wonderful fiancé in the audience today, that a tiny part of me felt a sense of relief. Relief that I could continue this facade of being Pakistani in parts of my life and gay in others of being able to separate the things that it felt inconceivable to hold together. You see, for as long as I could remember, there had been nothing short of a war raging inside of me. But it was a war that I didn't start, a war ignited by other people's expectations of who I should be. The famous writer James Baldwin, who I absolutely adore, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room, he was interviewed once, and the interviewer said to him, James, you're poor, you're black, you're gay. You must think, shit, I've drawn the short straw. And do you know what he said without missing a beat? He said, no, 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 no. I've hit the jackpot. For the longest time, I wanted a button I could press to cure me of my sexuality. And when people would ask me, I would say, yeah, I would hit that button so hard I would break it. And then here was my hero, describing his innate identity as akin to winning the lottery, to hitting the jackpot. How could he get to this point? How could I? I want to tell you about my most vivid recollection about when this war that I mentioned, when it started. I was getting ready for school. I was about 13. And uh, I was watching a British breakfast TV show. And this actor was being interviewed for this new TV show. And he was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And I mean, I, I'm not exaggerating. There was cereal dripping from my mouth. And a few days later, I was driving home from the mosque with my parents. Sat in the, I was sat in the back, not them. And I saw the same beautiful face on this billboard. And I kind of double took. And next to this face, were the words, Queer as Folk, Channel 4, 10 p.m. Tuesday. It was Charlie Hunnam, the actor. Yeah, he's hot. Um, 
<laughs> the day came, and my parents and my siblings, we all went up to bed. And I pretended to do the same. But then I crept down the stairs, and I turned on the TV, and I set the volume to like volume two or volume one. The, the TV was whispering. <laughs> yeah, slightly different sounds to that. Um, I held the remote really tightly. And the show, very quickly, became really explicit. And it was abrupt. And I started flicking between the channels. I can't, I can't watch. But I want to watch. I shouldn't watch. I have to watch this. And this flickering TV, it was a manifestation of my anxiety. But then I stopped flicking. And watching these two men doing more than just kissing, in that moment, I came alive. I began to tingle. It was almost as if I had lived in this house, in this body, for 13 years, and suddenly I'd found a new room. But it wasn't just any room, it was the ballroom. And inside of this beautiful ballroom, there was music, and there was dancing, and it was exhilarating. But almost in that very same split second, I felt petrified, scared, profoundly alone, and possessed. Yes, I thought that I was possessed by a demon spirit. Now, I'd like you to pause and imagine that for a moment with me. A child that thinks that there is something so wrong with the way that they are born, which they have no control over, and, and which does not harm anybody else, that it must be the work of evil. The reason that I campaign for the, so -called, that for the ban on uh, so-called conversion therapy is because we have countless queer children right now in this country and all over the world who are having their very innocence, the very essence of childhood, robbed from them because they believe that they should be cured, who are deeply alone, and who, like I was once, are about to wage a war with themselves. And I'm getting emotional because it, I really care about it, and it, I, hate, I hate that it's happening on our watch. My war raged for years and years, and all I wanted was for it to stop. So much so that at times I thought about ending it all. You know, we often talk about the pursuit of happiness, but I think we miss something. Imagine for a second that you're on a violently turbulent plane. As you're sat there in that chair, gripping that armrest, are you hoping that the flight attendant is going to whack on some Rihanna and bring you a G&T? No. You want the turbulence to stop. We spend so much of our time striving for this elusive thing called happiness, when really, the opposite of sadness to me is not happiness. It's peace. I don't need the GNT. I just need the plane to stop shaking. I had a mental breakdown because I couldn't find a way of holding these parts of me back together. And then when I came to writing the book, I had one editor who needed to say I didn't end up working with, who said, Mossin, you know what? This isn't one book. This is four books. One on race, one on class, one on sexuality, and then one on faith. She said, Mossin, do you know, the thing is, it would just be like near impossible to do this justice, to do it properly, to make a success of it. Near impossible. That phrase really stayed with me, because this was my existence. If I couldn't make a success of writing it down, what hope did I have of doing it in real life, of actually living a truly intersectional life successfully? Now, we heard a little bit from Sinead about intersectionality, and many of you will have heard the term before. But perhaps fewer of you will know about the origins of the term. 
and forgive me for a moment because I'm a lawyer by training, and so I'm going to geek out for a second and tell you about the heritage of the term. And as Sinead said, it was coined by a wonderful woman who was also a lawyer called Kimberly Crenshaw. And 30 years ago, there was an American factory, and they had hired white women to be secretaries and black men to work on the factory floor. But the problem was that black women were not being hired. And then they took this case to court and said, we're being discriminated against. And the judge said, no, they've got women, they've got black people, what are you complaining about? Kimberly Crenshaw recognised that the world was so used to putting everyone in these boxes that there was no way of de dealing with people that didn't fit neatly into just one box. And so the term intersectionality was born. We live in an increasingly divided world, constantly being asked to pick a side. Left, right, black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight. But the truth is that whether you're a poor, queer, brown, Muslim, or a cis, white, heterosexual male, none of us are just one thing. A famous writer said that there is no such thing as a single issue cause because we do not lead single issue lives. What to do then when you don't fit neatly into one of these boxes that society has carved out for you? Publishing the book was my attempt to say enough is enough. I am not a box ticking exercise and nor will I sit compliantly in the box that you have built for me. I'm not a series of labels that you can place upon me so that you know where to put me in the underdeveloped filing system of your mind. But telling this story was not easy to do. I was filled with trepidation and with genuine, constant fear. Because as I said at the start, when I told you about looking in that mirror, I was so accustomed to keeping these worlds apart that stating so publicly that I was a gay Muslim felt like nothing short of self-sabotage. Silence is always easier. But in the words of writer Audre Lorde, as we wait in silence for that final luxury of fearlessness, that silence will choke us. I have never stopped being afraid. I am afraid right now. And I'm sometimes asked, Mossin, where do you find the courage to say something? The thing is, courage isn't something that we find. It is something that we must grow. But even then, bravery will never eradicate your fear. Fear will always be a part of us. And the point is, we cannot remain silent, even if we are afraid, because that silence fuels our oppression. So, what does it mean to me to live my best life? Well, this talk is entitled The Four Pieces of a Life. And to me, living my best life is about finding a way of bringing these pieces that I've spoken about back together harmoniously. And in order to explain what I mean, I'm going to borrow from the Japanese art form of kintsugi. The Japanese believe that, let's say you have a, a ceramic bowl and it breaks into four parts. Instead of throwing it away, the Japanese will put the bowl back together using golden resin. So what you have is this new bowl with these gold lines running through it, a bit like this image behind me. That's because the Japanese believe that there is beauty in the broken. And I feel that way about our identities. Without exception, we are all born whole. We are born one thing, but quickly broken into parts because the societal expectations and cultural norms told that if you are gay, you cannot be a Muslim. If you are a woman, you must behave like this, but not like that. If you are a liberal, you must think about this in this way and not in this way. And the exercise of our lives becomes finding a way of bringing these seemingly irreconcilable parts back together so that like that bowl, we can once more be complete, drawing strength from these once broken parts to fulfill our true purpose. 
As the last speaker at this year's Voices, I've been thinking so much about the incredible people that we have heard from. But something draws me back to the very first of them. Yesterday, Dame Vivian Westwood opened Voices with a call to action on climate change. And the sentence that she said really stayed with me. She said, we are defending ourselves from our own aggression. It strikes me that this isn't just true of the global climate emergency, but of our personal emergencies too, of the wars that rage inside of each of us. We are defending ourselves from our own aggression. As a once broken person, I know that there is strength in the broken, and there is so much beauty too. My cancelled wedding to this gorgeous man right here, who didn't want me to say that, <laughs> is, is rescheduled for this April. And I'm really hoping that Omnicrom doesn't get in the way. I can't wait to put on that Shirvani and walk hand in hand with my Irish fiance to celebrate our, wait for it, big, gay, Irish, Pakistani, Muslim, Catholic wedding. You know why? Because James Baldwin has taught me that by once being broken into four pieces of a life, I've now hit the jackpot. Thank you.